All right, it's an exciting day for so many reasons. It's Friday, April 1st. It's not raining. It's April Fool's Day. But most importantly, I know you're excited about this brand new video. This will help you find a missing side on similar shapes. This is something we've been testing in class and we will test again. Please use this as a study tool to help you out. Here we go. As you know, this is classroom standard number three, Oregon State Standard 7.2.4, talking about solving problems using proportional relationships, including similarity and congruence. Here we go. All right, just like on the test we've taken, got a couple of uh, shapes here. These are triangles. And the problem tells you they are similar. You should love problems like that because you don't have to decide if they are similar or not. Uh, what does this mean, though? In this case, it means same shape, different size. There's lots of big, fancy definitions you can use, including in your glossary and your book. But the bottom line is, when you're trying to remember stuff like this, Short and sweet is better. Okay, same shape, different size. Now on a little sidebar over here, I'm going to scoot over to the side. A common mistake when people are talking about similar would be something like this. If I have a right triangle, and then let's say I have a little uh, scalene triangle going on over here. Some people might say that these are similar, but they are not. Okay. They are, they're the same shape because they're both triangles. And, and don't think that because they're both triangles, that makes them the same shape. They need to be the same type of triangle, right? I didn't leave enough room there. But the bottom line is, this is a right triangle, which has a 90 degree angle. This is a scalene, which does not have a right triangle. So even though you might be tempted to go, oh, they're the same shape, they're both triangles. No, they need to be the same type. Okay, back we go over to here. So these two triangles are the same shape, different size. Okay, use a proportion to find x. Now I know that many of you are clever and have other ways of finding these answers. But since this standard I'm testing you on is, do you know how to use proportions to get the answer? You need to adjust your solution method to show me that you can do this standard, okay? That's cut and dried. There's no way around it. I'm testing you on this standard. Show me that you know how to do it. That's it. So make an adjustment. As you know, a proportion is an equation showing that two ratios are equal, okay? And each ratio we write as a fraction. So it's going to look like this, two fractions on each side of an equation. Here we go. So first of all, I want to find corresponding sides. Back over to a sidebar here. I'll go down here. Corresponding, as we've, as we've talked about, corresponding means same relative place on two similar or congruent shapes. So let's mark all the corresponding sides here. I think that's a good idea on a problem like this. We've got the short side up here. I'm going to put one line there. What side corresponds with that? Or is it the same relative place? So even though we've spun this triangle, we've rotated it, we can see that there's a similar, there's a corresponding side here, the same relative place on the bigger shape. Bam, right there. Okay, now if I go for the four here, I'm going to put two marks there just to mark that I'm aware that's a second side. What side corresponds with that? We have two choices, the 10 or the 12 and a half. Now, if we were thinking, hey, we flipped it and rotated it, then it would be the 12 and a half. But you're not going to see anything crazy like that on a pencil and paper test. If I had something in your hands, maybe. So I can see that the four is over to the left and around the corner. 
of the 3, just like the 10 is down here. And then that leaves this unlabeled side corresponds with the 12 and a half. So I've got all my corresponding sides labeled. You can take your pick, but I'm going to use the uh, unknown here, the X, for my first ratio. And since we always go copy to original, this is the copy. So I'm going to go X is to 3, all right, the corresponding side that it goes with, the same way that 10 is to 4. Copy on top of original, copy original, copy original. We keep everything in the same order. If they're not in the same order, you won't get the right answer. Simple as that. We're going to cross multiply now. 4 times x is 4x, and 3 times 10 is 30. Divide both sides by 4. Why? Because 4 divided by 4 is 1, which leaves us with 1x. That's our goal, is to have the variable isolated on one side. How many times does 4 fit into 30? Well, it fits in 7 times, which gets me to 28. And then there's 2 left over. 2 out of 4 is 1 half, so it fits in 7 and a half times. There. Now I'm going to check my question again. Use a proportion to find x. I have a proportion, two ratios, I solved it, I have x. I'm done with that part, okay? I could even label it over here. Makes sense. Okay, and finally, what is the scale factor of the copy to the original? The scale factor is just the ratio of the two shapes. Sometimes it's larger, sometimes the copy is larger than the original, sometimes smaller. But the thing to remember is that we always put the copy on top of the original. All right, so the scale factor. Here's an easy one. Since I have it up here already, there's copy to original. Are you going to stop there? No. Okay, the scale factor always needs to be reduced, simplified. Okay, so we can take any two corresponding sides, okay? You don't have to take the 10 and the 4. Any two corresponding sides of similar or congruent shapes. I chose 10 and 4 because it's the only pair of numbers I have up here that are not decimals or fractions, right? I took the simplest ones. I like that. Now, I, I see that I can reduce this. I can cut them both in half, right? I can go 10 fourths and... Multiply top and bottom by one half, and I get five over two. And then, oh, we all like to make it as simple as possible, right? What if I cut this in half again? And I know I will see this answer. If this were a test, I would see this many, many times. But you know what? Don't do that. We don't like to have a partial numerator or denominator when we're dealing with something that's already a fraction, right? We don't want a fraction inside of a fraction. So we want to take it down to the lowest possible number that's still a whole number. Just write that here. Maybe if you write it, you'll remember. We want to keep whole numbers in the numerator and the denominator of our scale factor. That's going to make it easier if we have other parts of the problem to do. If we have to figure out the area or some other thing, we want whole numbers here. Okay, So we're going to back up the truck and use this one because 5 over 2, that's the lowest possible whole number on the top and bottom for the scale factor. That's the answer. Circle it again. Dance around it. Celebrate. 5 over 2 is the scale factor. And we are done. Thank you and good night.